Hi, so in this video, I will talk about the probability density function of a normal variable. And we will show that if we integrate from negative infinity to infinity, it will equal 1. So this function, this is our probability density function of a normal random variable. And we want to show that if we integrate from negative infinity to infinity over x, this will equal 1. And we know this should be solved because if we sum all the probabilities, which is what we do when we integrate, the total sum of all probabilities should be equal to 1, otherwise it can't be a probability density function. So how do we do that? Well, first let's make the function look simpler and let's assume that the mean mu is 0 and the sigma, the standard deviation, is 1. And that, as you know, will give us our standard normal probability density function. So this is the PDF of a standard normal. Mu is 0, sigma is 1, so that's why it looks simpler. And now we want to see what does it equal to if we integrate it from negative infinity to infinity over the variable x. So let's define variable a, which is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of this function over x. So what we're doing here is we're integrating this function and we know that the integral is the total area under the curve, this area. So in this case we're integrating over x from negative infinity to infinity and we're computing the area under the curve for this range of x, so therefore we're computing this total area. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, it may be easier to work with a squared, and let's define a squared. Well, that is just the integral, which is a as we defined, times itself. And here we just write the variable as y, so we indicate that it's a different integral. So here we combine it this way, and as you can see, these square roots will multiply into 2 pi because we have square root of 2 pi times square root of 2 pi, and now we have a double integral over x and over y. Uh, yep, so the square roots multiply together and we just get 2 pi and then we can combine these exponents and we get minus and we can put them inside the brackets so we get minus x squared plus y squared over 2 and we're integrating over x and over y and because this is a constant we can take it outside the integral. So how do we compute that integral? Well, there is a way. It's called polar transformation, and if you're not familiar with that, you can read more about it. So what we do is we redefine the variables. So let x equal i times cosine theta and y equals i times sine theta. And then we have dx dy equal r times dr and d theta. So now we will be integrating over r and over theta, while before we were integrating over x and over y. And we can also see that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. And that is because we know that cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. And that comes from the trigonometry laws. So... Again, before, we had a double integral and we were integrating over x from negative infinity to infinity and over y from negative infinity to infinity. But since we did a variable change, we no longer have x and y. Now we have r and theta, so we will be integrating over theta and over r. And now we have to see the limits of integration. And because r is a radius, it can't be negative. So it can only be greater 
are equal to zero and go to infinity. That's why we have this. And theta is an angle, and we know that the angle can be from zero to two pi. So now these are the new limits of integration. So now our double integral looks like this. We no longer have x and y because we did a variable change, but we have r and theta and we're integrating over r and over theta. This is a constant that we had in front of the double integral. Now the theta goes from 0 to 2 pi because theta is an angle and r is a radius, it can't be negative, so it goes from 0 to infinity. And before here we had in brackets x squared plus y squared, but we show that once we change the variables, this equals r squared. And here we had dx dy, and that is now r dr d theta. So we want to compute the integral. And here I just show this in brackets in order to make it more clear what I do next. So first we can compute the integral which is from 0 to infinity over r and this is what we have in brackets and since we're computing the integral we need to find the antiderivative and the antiderivative of that expression is this. So this is what we have. We got rid of one integral because we computed the antiderivative. So what is this term in brackets? Well, the first term is this expression where r is equal to infinity. So since it's infinity, we have to take the limit. So as you know, if it's a negative exponent, that it means it's 1 over that expression. So that's why we can express this when r is infinity as the limit of n as n goes to infinity. And this is the expression and n goes to infinity. And the second term, as you remember when we integrate, the second term is we subtract this expression for the value of r when it's 0. So that's why we subtract this expression here and replace 0 instead of r. So what does this equal, this limit? Well, here we have e to the power of something really, really large because n goes to infinity. So we have 1 over something really large and we know that will be 0. So here we have 0. And here we have e to the power of 0, because this whole term is 0, and we know that is 1. That's why here we get negative 1, because here we had a minus. So now we just have an integral from 0 to 2 pi over theta. And now this is easy to compute. Well, we see we have 0 minus a negative 1, and that simplifies to 1 and we have integral over theta. Well, that's quite simple because then we just have theta and we have to compute it from zero to two pi and we do that by having two pi minus zero, so we get two pi. And because we had the constant term here, we get two pi over two pi, which is one. Okay, that's great. So. What did we show? Well, we showed that a squared, which is this expression, this expression is equal to 1. So what does it mean for a? Because we wanted to find the value of a, and remember, a was just this expression, this integral. Well, we know this integral is greater than 0. It's not less than 0 because here we have e to the power of something which is always a positive number or 0 because e is a positive number. So a positive number to the power of something is always positive. Therefore a is greater than 0 and a squared is 1. Well a is the square root 
of a squared. So it's square root of 1, and we know it's a positive 1 because a is positive. So a equals 1. Well, that's great. So we showed that if we integrate the normal standard PDF from negative infinity to infinity, we get 1. But what about the general case? Because we wanted to see what does this whole integral equal. This is the normal PDF, not the standard normal. Well, we can do a simple transformation here. So this whole term looks complicated, right? Well, let's make it simpler and let's define y as x minus mu over sigma. So we're doing a change of variable here and then dy is dx over sigma. Because you can see from this expression, if we have dy over dx, well, we'll just get 1 over sigma. So dy is dx over sigma. So then what does this term equal? Well, we defined x minus mu over sigma as y. Therefore, this term we get minus y squared over 2. And what is dx? Well, we just computed from here. Sigma goes to the other side, so we get sigma times dy. So then our integral looks simpler now. Instead of x minus mu squared over sigma squared, we just have here this expression. And instead of dx, we have sigma times dy because we did a change of variable. And as you can see, the sigmas will cancel out, and we're just left with this expression. Well, what does that look like? Well, that just looks like as an expression for the standard normal, and the integral is from minus infinity to infinity, but we just showed that this integral equals 1. So there we go. We showed that the integral from negative infinity to infinity for normal random variable for the PDF of it is equal to 1.